Well, good evening. Welcome to this evening's live stream. As usual, I'll just start off by telling you a little bit about some guests we've got coming up in the next few weeks, and then I'll introduce our special guest for this evening, a professor, no less, joining us tonight. Now, coming up next week, we've got David Scott is from a UK Column. You might be familiar with that YouTube channel, uh, quite big UK-wide. Uh, and the weeks after that, we've got someone coming on to talk about so-called uh, conversion therapy, an expert in that stuff, which will be very interesting. And also, we're just finalizing arrangements for a representative of the Hungarian governments to come on and have a chat with us to talk about their pro-family uh, policies. So that's going to be uh, be very exciting as well. So we're just putting the finishing touches to arrangements for that. But that will all be well be in two weeks' time. Now, as I always say in these live streams, what we re would really like is to alternate. So one week we have someone who might be quite on our wavelength. Another week we have someone we can debate with. But finding people to debate with in Scotland, it's really hard work. We're forever inviting people, say, organizations, individuals, please would someone just come onto the live stream and debate with us. Just discuss some of these issues. Let's have a friendly discussion and see where we end up. But it's, it's, it's hard work to find anyone to do that. We've got a couple of irons in the fire, but we'll see who we find over the next few weeks. Uh, I'll give our annual conference uh, its weekly plug. That's a week on Saturday now. Uh, again, fantastic lineup, all sorts of extremely interesting uh, speakers from the comfort of your own home uh, online. So you can find links for that on various social media. But do sign up. It'd be good to see you on screen and hear your contribution to our conference. Right, moving to this evening, we have with us uh, in a little moment is Professor David Payton, who is a professor of industrial economics at Nottingham University. And he's also taken a research interest in sort of teenage pregnancy, sex education policy as well. So it's great to have David with us. So David, welcome. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here, Richard. Uh, it's good to have you with us. The first question has got to be, what's the possible connection between industrial economics and teenage pregnancy policy and sex education? Well, economists are well used to looking at models of risk and insurance. And actually, um, there's, there's lots of links between how we think people take decisions under conditions of uncertainty. And we might think of that in, in the industry and you might have insurance policies out to affect what you do. And actually, there's lots of parallels. And we use many of the same models for looking at sex uh, decisions by teenagers. And when there's sort of insurance type things like you have a, a, an abortion law that for some young people that may be treated a bit like an insurance policy for their decision. That, and that in turn may affect their decision. So it's actually a classic e economics problem of decisions under risk and uncertainty. That's an interesting approach. Is that quite a widespread approach? Are there people all over the world? Yeah, this is quite quite a big. I mean, economists we get we get everywhere. We're very um, mm -hmm. colonialist, uh, and you know, I've, I've had a long background in the in the pro life movement and an interest in these issues. And when I discovered a number of years ago that actually there's mainly in America, but there's lots of mainstream economists looking at these sorts of issues, not from a sort of right or wrong, but more if we introduce this policy. What are some of the consequences? Which is more the approach, you know, we're economists. We don't have morals. We don't have, we don't know our rights from our from our wrongs, or at least we're trained to try and separate out the two. And um, mm -hmm. it really opened my eyes that you know this was an area of research where I had an interest in. But yes, lots of economists had look, looked at it in the sort of health economics, um, law and economics field. So, you know, it's uh, it's great. I'm very lucky in my job that you can, you know, with, you've got some discretion to choose the research areas. And you're judged on on whether you you go through peer review and get published in good journals. But within that criteria, if you've got if you're publishing research that is impactful and seen as useful to the community, then you know you're able to have that uh, that that discretion to to choose your areas. Yeah, well, so I'm sure this is going to be fascinating. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of new things for all of us in what you're going to have to say. So, what are the, some of the main findings from your your thinking in this area? So I, I guess you could you could summarise the findings fairly fairly simply. People have looked at the impact, for example, of sex education, of providing the morning after pill in schools, of um, looking at whether um, parental opt outs for uh, contraception or for sex education. And, and a lot of the focus is on sort of outcomes people over the past 20, 30 years have been worried about teenage pregnancies or sexually transmitted infections. Of course, it's a much broader picture than that but they're sort of measurable things that we're often told well this is the sort of approach you need to reduce teenage pregnancy rates 
And I guess I would summarize the findings as pretty much nothing has much of an effect anyway. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily that you know you have a, you know introduce a sex education scheme into a to a school. There's all sorts of research you can find. You know the odd study that finds one positive effect and the other a negative effect. Generally, the better quality the study, the more likely it's to find not much of an effect at all. Not completely across across a piece. So, for example, um, I think in Scotland as well as England, we've had long had a policy of uh, providing the morning after pill or emergency birth control free uh, free of charge in schools to children or in sexual health clinics and so on. And there's quite a lot of work looking at the impact of this. Pretty much everything finds there's no impact on reducing teenage pregnancies or unwanted pregnancies or abortions. And people have looked at it from all sorts of different angles, you know, looking at countrywide policies or sort of randomised controlled trials where they set it up a bit like a medical experiment. And they all find the same sort of thing. There's no effect on teenage pregnancy rates. But those studies do find that those policies can have a, a, a bad effect, if you like, on sexually transmitted infections. So, um, you know, the, the, the morning after pill offers no protection against STIs. Um, and if, you know, underpinning that the lack of an effect on teenage pregnancy rates is that there's some induced change in behaviour. So teenagers may, may perhaps take more risks than they would have done otherwise. Mm -hmm. Then you can end up with an increase in sexually transmitted infections. So, you know, some of these policies can have perverse effects. They can have unintended consequences, but very rarely do they have much of an impact on what they're trying to achieve in terms of reducing teenage pregnancy rates or, or STIs. Yeah. So if we're trying to measure the impact, how much of the problem is just there are so many variables it's difficult to actually pinpoint the effect it's having. And to what extent do you think it is that actually it doesn't make any difference? Well, I, I think, yeah, they, they, every type of research has pros and cons. I think the fact that from a variety of different uh, research approaches or methodologies, you, you get similar results is suggests that, you know, there's probably not much of an effect. I mean, it's always hard to prove no effect, you mm -hmm. know, um, you, you know, maybe effects that are very small, you just can't measure. But just for example, uh, a paper I've recently had published in a journal called Health Economics with um, some colleagues at St Mary's University has looked at the impact of uh, sex education mandates on, on you know, laws, countries mm -hmm. have laws saying you have to have sex education mm -hmm. in school from a particular age. And it's been quite a controversial policy. And for years, you know, people have been pushing in the UK for that and eventually su successfully. But there's been very little research actually saying, well, you know, do these laws forcing schools to do to have sex education, do they have an impact on things like teenage pregnancy rates? So, so what we did, we looked at lots of different countries, uh, looked at the timing of when sex education mandates were introduced or sometimes removed. And then um, we, we these what economists would call panel data. So you look at sort of lots of countries over time. So of course, mm -hmm. some countries will have higher teenage pregnancy rates than others for cultural and social reasons or religious reasons. And also, over time, some things will change. So you might have a recession and that might might have an effect on teenage pregnancy rates for, for some reason, or you might have an increase in family breakup. Mm -hmm. so with this sort of data, you can sort of try and control for all these other effects, include other variables as well, and then try to identify, uh, you know, a causal effect of when you introduce this policy change, what happens before and after relative to other similar countries that didn't have that policy change. So when you've got enough countries um, you know, you can never be 100% certain about cause and effect, but you can get quite mm -hmm. close to sort of the, the, the approach that which medics would use to, to drugs, you know, with randomised controlled trials mm -hmm. in terms of evaluating policies. You can also, can, you know, look at the, the group age group affected relative to what happened to teenage pregnancy rates in uh, girls and women a little bit older who weren't affected mm -hmm. by, the, by the policy. So there's some quite mm -hmm. neat statistical things you can do to get to cause and effect. Um, so, so, so why is it we hear just the flat statement that this sort this sex education is just vital in order to achieve these goals? How do people get away with making these claims? Well, how do they get away with it? Because um, you know, they they I guess people don't interrogate the data or the research evidence well enough. And mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it it's quite easy. You sometimes get summaries of evidence where you make you find some quite generalized statements and then you actually go and look at the papers on which that evidence is based, often when the Scottish or the UK or the UK or the English or Welsh government produces a report, uh, you actually look at the papers, it's quite hard 
to get to find where the evidence is. And you look at the really strong evidence and it's like, yeah. it's really, you know, ju ju just not there. How did they get away with it? Well, it's when politics and science, I guess, get to get mixed up. You know, if you quite understandably, you know, these mm -hmm. are controversial issues and people have all sorts of different views of what they think should happen. Um, yep. And then, you know, it, it's tempting to sort of, you'll, you go and look for, uh, you know, the evidence that, that might fit fit that. And, you know, I think we all have to be aware of that that tendency and, and our own, you know, I've got strong views on these things and we have to sort of think, well, you know, let's try and be objective. But I, I think, you know, you, 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 you look at things like um, the Cochrane reviews. I think people know about the Cochrane reviews, either sort of summaries of medical type evidence, randomized controlled trials, seen as the sort of gold standard of that type type of approach, a slightly different way of looking at it to my mm -hmm. an economist way of looking at the policy evidence. But the but the Cochrane surveys of sex education in schools, for example, are really quite quite, quite damning. You know, these are sort of you know reviews of reviews, so meta-analysis mm -hmm. of lots of mm -hmm. different studies. And the most recent Cochrane evidence says, you know, th there's just very little evidence that these things have much of an effect on uh, on anything. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm generalising, of course. You can uh -huh. on little sort of details yeah. and nuances, but um, so you know, it, it's not. You know, you can be quite objective about this, and we're not overstating the the, the case. And, and what, what I, I often say is, you know, it, it's fine to to make a case for what what you think. You know, if you think that children should have a particular form of sex education from the age of five, or you believe it should be later, or you believe it should be a certain type that they're all you know there's lots of good arguments there what you shouldn't do is say well we have to do this particular type of approach to achieve lower rates of teenage pregnancy for example because mm -hmm. the evidence isn't isn't there you know make your case for what you think is right or wrong what's it, what sort of education you want children to have what information you want them to have and based on your own you know be frank about your own um values uh you know we, we can't escape from them and i think sometimes some politicians try and sort of pretend that it's a values free approach to these yeah. subjects and, and actually yeah. you know, it's often not we all have values and quite rightly and let's be frank about them and have that open debate about what we think is right for our children yeah i think what, what often seems to happen is the the sort of academic sociology educational world has got its own bias very definitely so it always finds evidence to support its own view it, it never produces well, hardly ever produces evidence that challenges its its core values, if you like. So, so there's this constant stream of, of so-called research evidence that's coming out, like I say, often very small scale and poor quality. But it's what people want to hear. And then when it gets to the political arena, and I think in, in Scotland, I mean, the sex education resources produced by the Scottish government are, are horrific, I mean, they're absolutely appalling. And I think John Swinney, the education minister who's approved it all and stands there defending it, I don't think he's really a proponent of the ideology behind it. I think he's just been fooled by the people who presented it with him because all the people around him, all the advisors will be saying, look, this is what the evidence says. This is what you have to do. This is what the experts say. So he just says, oh, well, you know, I suppose so. Okay, that's what that's what we'll do. Uh, but if people haven't got that sort of critical thinking, critical stance towards it, that's what's going to happen. The people are just going to be vulnerable to whichever campaigner speaks in their ear, aren't they? Yeah, yeah there, there's some truth in that. I'll just separate out the actual research. So even in the, in the areas of sociology, but also the economics, the health policy research, if you go back to the core um, research articles, they're often very, you know, you, you get a range, you get some very poor ones, but there's often some very good research. And it's not the case that this research always comes up with the with the outcomes. You know, you can look at uh, some sociological research looking at the teenage pregnancy strategy in England, which concluded it was absolutely useless in terms of the outcomes. It was, it was more mm -hmm. looking at a qualitative approach. They did use some numbers in there. Very consistent with, um, you know, some of the work which I've done looking at sort of spending on teenage pregnancy rates and so on. So it's not necessarily the original research. Very often it's the mediators of that research. So you get a group mm -hmm. like, look, I don't know if Brooker Active in Scotland or the Family Planning Association or whichever lobbyist it might be or a sex education uh, campaigning group. And they, they will, as you say, you know, they'll put evidence together and frame it in a certain way or what they say is evidence. And mm -hmm. that is what the ministers and the politicians will, uh, will, will see. So, you know, I think I'd just separate out, you know, that there is some good research that, that mm -hmm. goes on there. And we shouldn't be afraid of it, you know. And, and you know, the research doesn't always come out in the way that you know I might like or somebody else might like in terms of their 
you know our, our world views but we shouldn't be afraid of that that's that's the way it is you know life is life yeah. and uh, we, yeah. we, we have to face in social science you know you can find different findings and very rarely is one paper the end of the the end of the argument but we, mm -hmm. we, we should look at that frankly but we should not um overstate or say what the evidence doesn't show and i think that uh -huh. you're right that is where politicians often get told um yeah oh yeah the evidence is all on on this side you know you you do have a sort of in some pl places i think the people who have the ear of the politicians have a particular view of this whole sort of area in terms of sex education and you know associated things you know how you deal with sexual health services um and th and that role the role of young you know ha how young people should have access to those services mm -hmm. uh, and, and i think that's where the problem lies yeah but we often hear things along the lines of such country x they've got the most liberal sex education you can imagine and, and you know, look how fantastically it it works out but it, it takes a, a lot of effort to actually look into that properly doesn't it to assess the situation oh, yeah. in a different country and actually yeah. see what is going on in schools yeah that's right and then, but i mean the often this work is out there so ne the netherlands has always been sort of framed as that and actually when you looked at the evidence and you, some of you may, may have seen the, the family education trust report a few years ago by Joost van loon who's a professor of um sociology and, and, and media who is dutch and he actually went to look at what was going on in schools right. and it was fascinating uh -huh. because he found that it was, it was a few years ago now but um you know actually it, there's a huge range of different types of sex education going on in the Netherlands, much of it much more conservative and restrictive than in practice what was going on in the UK. And actually, at the time, it's changed slightly now, but it was mandatory later than in the UK. It tended to start a bit later and parents were much more involved. Yeah. And um, so although, yeah. the, although you know, there was some truth to the stories, you know, you did have some examples of very, very liberal sort of graphic uh -huh. sex education, it was much, much different. So there was no, you know, at the time, no mandatory sex ed by, by schools of, of a particular type. And, and overall, it started later than the UK and was probably more yeah. conservative. Yeah. So you know, often the reality is very different to the, the impression people have. Yeah. These extreme liberal lessons, but they've probably got a TV camera crew in virtually every week. Because Channel Four will be doing a documentary one week, then the BBC—it just <laughs> people just focus on them. I mean, there's an endless stream of reports. This sort of sex education. I, mean, I read some things about the Netherlands as well, it was saying that their the sort of family breakdown and social problems are a far lower level in the Netherlands, and this is a massive factor in their better statistics for teenage pregnancy and lots of other things as well. But those things tend to be left to one side, and the emphasis is on this extreme sex education that goes on on in a minority of schools in some particularly different in some areas of the Netherlands where these problems are much more serious in general but, yeah, that, that's right I think and I think you know there's really good evidence on things like family breakup on mm -hmm. poverty on educational levels as having a big influence on teenage pregnancy rates so the, the example I always have it's slightly out of date now but you know people will point to the Netherlands but the other country which at the time and, and still does have very very low levels of teenage pregnancy rates but also teenage birth rates was of course the republic of ireland and northern mm -hmm. ireland but mm -hmm. the, the, the sort of sexual health campaign has very rarely looked at those countries because that's where abortion until recently was uh, was illegal and you know it certainly wasn't at the forefront of um, very liberal yeah. sex education and access to birth control and so on but actually their results were you know really comparable if not even better than the netherlands for under 16s and yeah. of course you know, there's a question over how many abortions actually took place amongst young people from the Republic of Ireland, although we had some data from the UK. But even just looking at uh, births, you know, you'd think with abortion being illegal, you'd have high rates of teenage births, quite quite the opposite. You know, the low, once amongst the lowest in Europe for under 16s, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the Republic yeah of just, just going back to the, um, the morning after pill and abortion <laughs> statistics. Well, are there any other cases where people have been able to detect that sort of effect, how would I describe it? It's like the harm reduction approach. If you reassure people that an activity can be made less risky than it would otherwise be, they're more likely to engage in it. We haven't eliminated the risk completely, so you can end up with more uh, more harm result, um, overall. I made a, a sort of joke video a few weeks ago about uh, joyriding, as it was an educational video about joyriding. And it was explaining to the children how to keep safe while you're joyriding you know wear a helmet slow down for the corners or whatever um the point being that you know if you make people feel more confident in engaging in the activity more of them are likely 
to do it. Do you think that's the fact? Do you think that's what's at play there? Yeah, the, the evidence is fairly consistent with that. And I think that that's an obvious explanation for why when, for example, you have the morning after pill, um, which of course will stop some people from getting pregnant, but it doesn't seem to re lead to a reduction in overall pregnancy rates or abortion rates. So, you know, there's a, sort of two explanations. Either it, it, it just doesn't stop anyone getting getting pregnant. Well, that, that's, you know, un un unlikely because in many of these cases, there is a reasonable amount of uptake from it. Um, uh -huh. Or there's some sort of behavioural change which sort of compensates. So you get some young people who perhaps would have had sex anyway. You know, you're a 15, 14 year old. There's a range of views and behaviour. Yeah. You know, one of the most annoying phrases I often hear is, oh, well, they're going, you know, 15 year olds, they're going to have sex anyway, whatever we do. Mm -hmm. All we can do is, you know, make them have it in the most safe way. It's the most nonsensical, ill thought mm -hmm. through statement you can imagine because we, we simply know that's not true but you look over time and across countries there's different rates of young people having sex at an, at an early age and of course yeah. there's all sorts of factors that affect things you know whether somebody's yeah. drunk at a party whether they think all their friends are doing it what the attitude of their parents are going to be if they're worried their parents will, will find out um you know the, the, the situation they're in you know how much they want to avoid getting getting pregnant so the idea that so economists we talk about at the margin so we're not mm -hmm. saying that, you know, you introduce the morning after pill in schools and that, oh, everyone then goes off at a party and starts having, um, you know, unprotected sex. No, but there may be some people at the margin who are sort of, you know, may or may not have decided to have sex or under pressure from their boyfriend or maybe from their girlfriend. Mm -hmm. um, they're looking at what their friends are doing and they don't really want to, but then oh, everyone else is doing it. And then you yeah. have this other thing comes into the mix that has some marginal effect. So some people's behaviour has changed. Yeah. Um, the, the other sort of related area that's, that's quite interesting is there's lots of work in the states looking at the impact of parental consent or parental involvement for um, abortion. So lots of states have introduced laws whereby parents have to be informed before somebody who's underage, for example, a you know, 15 year old, depending what the age of consent is, has an mm -hmm. abortion. Some of them parents even have to give their consent. Again, you could think whether that's right or wrong. You know, in, in our country, you can be 13 and have an abortion on your own and your parents don't have to know. Mm -hmm. But whether or not that's right or wrong, one of the implications of these laws seems to be that, yes, it does seem to lead to a reduction in underage sexual activity. And that comes out not only in lower abortions, but lower sexually transmitted infections. So people, yes, they are taking less risk. And in fact, there's a, there's a fascinating paper. It's only one, but was looking at uh, teenage suicides and found that there was a really strong correlation that the states that had introduced these parental consent laws um again sort of controlling for other for time periods and other states that didn't had reductions in um in suicide so there's you know you can have unintended bad consequences and also perhaps unintended positive consequences of uh, some policies okay let me just get that straight so you say where so we're talking about parental consent or parental Parents being informed or consent or, or either? There's, there's a mixture and there's studies that look at both right. and some studies that put them together. So some laws say parents have to be told before mm -hmm. a minor has an abortion. And some states say a parent has to give consent. There's usually some exceptions for you know cases of abuse. Right. So the result of making it so that parents do have to be informed or give consent, what's, yeah. what's the result of so that? So what happens is you get, as you'd expect, fewer abortions. So yet some young people are worried about um, you know, the parents finding out. But it's right. not just that they then go on to have birth, give birth, um, that actually the decision making goes back earlier and fewer young people get pregnant in the first place. Right. Uh, but you, uh, and, and one of the ways you can pick out that there's this behaviour change is that you get a reduction in sexually transmitted infections. So that's a right. you know, okay. measure yeah. of risk taking behaviour. So mm -hmm. essentially you've got some young people who are now, you know, had this as, as an insurance, they knew they could go and their parents would never have to find mm -hmm. out. And now they're, they're thinking twice, oh, okay, so if I do get pregnant, you know, mum and dad or mum's going to going to find out or they've got to give permission. And again, not for everybody, but at the margin, that ha seems to have an effect on behaviour in the first place. So, you know, it, I think sometimes you often think what's a useful policy approach, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. influencing politicians. I, personally, I think this is a the, the, you know, the right thing to do. I think the, the idea that a 13 year old can have a serious medical procedure without her parents even knowing. You know, which I think is the same in Scotland, isn't it? Is uh, certainly uh, yeah, people, from, from twelve, yeah, um, Scotland, it, yeah. It's something like, you know many people find uh, quite staggering and and you know not yeah. not not right. But given that there's also evidence to back up, this is quite a sensible from a social policy point of point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's quite a um, good policy, I think, for 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 people to be thinking of something yeah. that's achievable and actually 
uh, most people can see the see the sense of. Yeah, but it's something. It's not a, a deterrent in the sense of a punishment, but it is an input to people's decision making process that can yeah, steer them right. in the direction that we want to. Yeah. But that sort of thinking would be completely alien within the sort of Scottish educational political yeah. establishment. I, 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 that they just wouldn't begin to think consider a view like that. It would be the same same in England, but actually, I'm not sure that all individual people are like that. So we had a case oh, so. uh -huh. years ago in England in, in Nottingham where. Um, a mum found her 15-year-old daughter upstairs and she'd be given, been given the abortion pill and she was having a miscarriage on her own. Uh -huh. And the mum just could not believe that the school who had taken her for the, for the abortion had not um, t at least told her, at least given the information so that she could give support to her, to her daughter. And I think that, yeah. you know, that, that, that does ring a chord with people because, um, you know, the, the other side of it is the, we, we perhaps will go on to talk about the, the issue of the impact of those sort of policies on uh, child sexual exploitation. Um, but just from a very personal human point of view, I think people with, with children understand, you know, parents, uh, children, of course, can be worried and they think their parents are going to mm -hmm. hate them and uh, never going to forgive them. And of course, the reality in, in most cases, you know, we, we love our children and we may, you know, we may be disappointed or unhappy, but it's not going to stop us loving and supporting mm -hmm. whatever's uh, unconditionally, what, what, whatever's happened. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, it actually can be very liberating for children when their parents, they, they don't think it's going to be, but when they're their parents do get involved in the situation and yeah. you know, yeah. be pos a positive experience all around, even yeah. out of a bad situation. Mm -hmm. but the story we heard it's a few months ago now, uh, parents of a, I think it was a 13 year old girl who was diagnosed with a mental health problem. But they knew that much. And everyone at the school, the teacher at the school knew all about it, but the girl decided she wanted to keep it secret from her parents. So her parents couldn't know what the diagnosis was. So the people living with this girl, most keen, willing, and able to help, were kept in the dark about it. It's just just outrageous. It's part of a much wider picture. Of, it's, it's the children's rights movement, basically. They're, they're trying to break down the barriers between adults and children. They're trying to liberate children from being oppressed by adults. They want to make children and adults equal in every possible way. And it's leading to all sorts of just bizarre policies. And it goes unchallenged in the parliament. Now, we'll come on to abuse in a minute. I just wanted to mention one other thing as well. The people who say, you know, the research is on their side and, you know, there's no point telling them not to do it because they'll just do it in any case um, or it'll make them want to do it even more. When I hear people say that, I always think what they really mean is that they're speaking from their personal value system. So these people who say, oh, there's no point telling them not to do this because they're going to do it in any case. So we just need to try and reduce the harm. Their personal view, I think, in almost all cases is, actually, that's fine. That's perfectly normal. That's what teenagers ought to be doing. I've got no problem with it. Because when it comes to something they really do think is wrong, then they're quite happy to be very direct with young people. So in the harm reduction approach is often a mask for people effectively sharing their quite promiscuous, hyper-liberal values with young people under the guise of, uh, of you know, there's no point telling them what to do. Yeah, I mean, there's this clear contradiction. You know, when you, when you come to talking about smoking to 14-year-olds, there might be, a, you know, you, you, you don't necessarily want to tell children what to do because children can then want to do the opposite. But uh -huh. the, certainly the intended outcome is not to limit the harms of smoking, not to encourage children to have you know, filtered cigarettes rather than roll-ups or lower tar cigarettes. <laughs> it's to make mm -hmm. sure they don't smoke because we know it's yeah. harmful for them. Yeah. And, and and the, the issue of, of, of sex is, of course, slightly different because sex isn't always harmful. It, you know, it can be it's a, it's uh -huh. a you know, wonderful gift in, in the right context. But I think when you're dealing uh -huh. with 12, 13, 14-year-olds, we, we shouldn't be afraid of saying, well, actually, there's all sorts of physical, psychological, medical evidence that and sex at a very early age is not a good out does not lead to good outcomes for young people and being quite unapologetic about saying well, if we want a public policy in this area you know one of the out outcomes should we should be looking to achieve is to delay sexual activity between young people whether it's uh, you know you, you may want to go further and say well you know it should only be in marriage or, or not but uh, you know putting that to one side just saying at a certain age, we should be ambiguous. It's not just have sex when you feel it's right, which is often what, what a message that comes over in some of the sex education yeah. um, texts. 
it, we, we can be unambiguous, a bit like smoking for 14 year olds. It's damaging to you. And, you know, you're below the, the age of consent. There's all sorts of strong evidence out there that actually delaying sex, um, even when it's consensual, uh, it, you know, has positive outcomes. And, and we, we shouldn't be shy, I think, about uh, putting that from a, from a public policy point of view. Yeah. But the age of consent in Scotland is sort of effectively 13 because the, the policy is to not prosecute people if they're over the age of 13, as long as they're not an age gap of more than three years. So young people are taught that, okay, technically it's illegal to have sex when you're 13, 14, 15, but, but basically don't worry, nothing's going to happen. So they, they've effectively changed the law without having to go through the controversy of being open about what they're doing and have to actually pass a bill saying that that's what they're doing. But that, that's effectively what the situation is. And that's what young people are, are taught in school. So they, yeah. They're, yeah they're, 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 you, I don't know if you, you, you know, do you know the Brook um, traffic light tool, which is very widely used across the country? I, I just had a look earlier on and, and there's a link on the Scottish government website to the Brook traffic light school and one of the expert re reports. Right. And, and this is guidance about sort of, you know, what they call green is positive sexual behaviour or, or sexual related behaviour. Amber is where there may be a worry about, um, you know, ch child safeguarding and, and red is when there's you know, a real problem. And uh -huh. uh, if, you, if you look at their, their age related guidelines, so if you look at their, their green behavior for children aged 13 to 17, so we're talking about 13 year olds. Mm -hmm. And one of the green behaviors, and green behaviors, uh, I've just got it in front of me, it says it provides opportunities for, to give positive feedback and additional information. So these are sort of positive things. One of them is uh, um, consenting oral and or penetrative sex with others of the same or opposite gender who are of similar age and developmental ability. So it's exactly mm -hmm. as you were saying, it, it, you know, mm -hmm. it's a policy that if you know 13 and maybe a 15 year old, it's not just something which we'd, we'd, we'd actually quite like to discourage. This is positive behaviour which you, mm -hmm. you reinforce. This is a guidance on the Scottish Government um, yeah. website. Yeah. I mean, the children in Scotland are taught that they've got the right to have illegal underage sex. I mean, you don't have to be a, like sort of a professor of logic to realize there's something a little bit inconsistent with that. But they're explicitly taught that this is a human rights issue and that's what you've got a right to. You've got an ex a right to explore your sexuality by engaging in uh, sexual activities. And that's taught to you know, 12 to 15 year olds when having sex is illegal. I mean, how a contradiction like that stands unchallenged or virtually unchallenged is, uh, well, is amazing. Yeah, that, that, that sort of r relates to the um, serious case reviews of child sexual exploitation, which we've seen over the past 10 years. And it, it mm -hmm. deals exactly with that problem. And this is not family campaigners. The, the, these are um, in-depth reports by social work and, and uh, local authorities of some of these really serious cases of child sexual exploitation. And systematically, these reports identify exactly that problem, this contradiction mm -hmm. we have in terms of the messages that young people are given out, that when it's consensual sexual activity and you're um, below age, that's a, you know, seen as an acceptable um, way, way forward. And mm -hmm. it's, it's really striking the, you know, the number of times in these reports that they identify this as a way in which child sexual exploitation was perpetuated or allowed to continue. And uh, it, it's a uh, it should pay tribute really to the, to Norman Wells, who was the who very sadly died earlier this year, and was a, mm -hmm. um, yeah. a chair or leader essentially of Family Educational Trust. And I, I had the pleasure of working with with Norman on his report, looking exactly at this, sort of going through systematically the, the various um, serious case reviews and identifying the pattern, not just you know one off cases, but the pattern of cases where you had a, you know a 13 year old who was treated as if they were having consent consensual sex was provided with a an abortion or a termination or a um, you know other uh, forms of birth control and the sexual exploitation was allowed to continue and you know you know what children are like they say oh yeah my boyfriend's 14 or 15 and yeah. the, the approach was oh they're being very responsible coming to talk to the school nurse uh -huh. and that turns out that you know the, it very often allowed exploitation to continue yeah, I mean, that should be a pretty compelling argument, shouldn't it? I mean, the, the yeah, fact yeah, that, yeah. That, that that point isn't at the forefront of discussion. 
No, I absolutely yeah, should be. And the, the, I mean, the serious case reviews have made recommendations to look again at you know the, the Gillick competency idea that the rules under which children under the age of consent are allowed to be provided with abortions or, or birth controls. So these mm. are in official reports asking the government uh, governments to look again. So there's one um, striking one from North Northumberland, um, which uh, from 2018, so just a couple of years ago, and this report found that approximately 85 percent, so I'm reading it, this is a quote from the report, of victims of sexual exploitation had received services from sexual health services. Right. And what the report mm -hmm. points out is that, um, that the current approach to confidentiality and to consent to treatment means identifying victims or potential victims is extremely difficult and unlikely to occur and it called for the government to urgently review confidential confidentiality and safeguarding that that's just one report yep. there's a there's a 10 or more yep. reports looking at that it's a systematic issue it's been identified uh, a government have been asked to look at it um yet no action seems to be taken yeah well so parents were informed it's quite likely the parents would would immediately piece together what was going on yeah. they would have an understanding and they would be wanting to do something about it no that's right but it's not sometimes it's not just parents you know the, the school nurse um so so the, an example you were talking about in, in scotland this is another case from hampshire which is in one of these serious case reviews and you had a vulnerable 15 year old with special needs who was being abused at school but the school judged her to be engaging in consensual activity that's the mm -hmm. wording from the from the report so her parents weren't informed and she continued to suffer abuse for, for years. It was treated as mm -hmm. something where they would try and minimise the harm associated with that, but they didn't tackle the behaviour. Parents weren't informed. And, uh, you know, it was a direct cause yeah. of, the, of the abuse continuing. Yeah. Uh, partly, I mean, you'd hope schools, for example, uh, medics would be alert to that sort of thing. But imagine in schools, there'd, there'd be quite a strong feeling in the school that they're so pleased. They feel they're doing such a good job. That the pupils are able they're so approachable the pupils can come and talk to them with these concerns so rather than having their antennae up thinking right what's going on here i imagine in a lot of cases there's, there's more uh, a complacency there you know, this is absolutely wonderful this is the system working at its best young people coming and sharing with us things they can't share with their uptight judgmental parents what a great job we must be doing well, uh, yeah, that, that, and so that, that's one, of the, one of the issues identified in some of the reports is this tension that you know they were implementing teenage pregnancy strategy to reduce teenage pregnancies, and yeah. they were so focused on this. So that exactly, exactly that. Oh, fourteen-year-old or fifteen-year-old is coming to the school nurse. You know, she's not going to get get pregnant. This is great, but the, the focus is on that, and what gets missed out is yeah. the uh, obvious um, risk of you know ch child sex exploitation, rather than seeing every case. Not just under thirteen-year-olds, but every Absolutely. case of a thirteen mm -hmm. or fourteen or fifteen-year-old, sometimes even older. But you know, there must be a risk here because we don't know how old the boyfriend is. We don't really know what's yeah. going on, and treating that in every case as a potential um, issue. All too often, what seems to have happened is that we've just gone down the route of you know, oh, would you like your parents to know? Oh no, of course, no, no, my that would be disaster. Uh -huh. I won't, I won't, I won't come use your services if that's the case. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, um, you, know, you end up with a situation where you don't tackle the, the underlying problem. Yeah. There's leaflets in Scotland that uh, young people, children can be given to explain to them how they can deal with you know, keeping things secret from their parents. So we'll say, if, if we need to write to you, these are the ways you can do it. Would you like it like delivering to a friend so they can give it to you? Or do you want to deliver into school so it doesn't have to go? You know, so there's strategies to try and... Uh, keep the parents in the dark about it. It's just uh, it's outrageous, but uh, it, it, it's just taken for granted that that's the way to go. Well, that's right. And I think the, the argument they would say is, oh, well, you know, not all parents are enlightened. And so, you know, you get parents who will um, won't, won't talk about these things or will stop their, their children from accessing services and then they may get pregnant. You now, that, that's sort of the way it, where it will come from. I think it's, it's worth sort of taking a step back and thinking what the what the, the issue is here, you know, of course, there, there are good and bad parents and even good parents, uh -huh. we, you know, we, we make mistakes and, and get things wrong. But we need to remember that so do schools, so do governments, so do social yeah. workers, often yeah. with, the, with the best of intentions, like, you know, parents mm -hmm. have the best of intentions. So you have to then take a step back and say, well, ultimately, you know, who has 
the children's best interests at heart. And mm-hmm. you know, in the normal run of things, it's the person who who actually loves them who you know who's going to be mm-hmm. the, the parents. And of course, we all you know we know there's cases of genuine abuse or things which, which go wrong, and it's quite right that there's interventions in those. But that yeah. that shouldn't well in my view that shouldn't drive the policy as a matter of course the default should be that we we know that the vast majority of parents love their children yet they make mistakes sometimes but you know they they want to do the best for the for the child and actually you're better off making sure that they're involved at every case and parent uh, teachers social workers also sometimes make make mistakes and yeah. uh, you can't just say well because some parents sometimes get it wrong but uh, the state getting involved will always be the right way to go. Yeah. Just to mention, Scottish Family Party policy is to make the age of consent 16 full stop with no uh, no exceptions at all. Um, just look, I think when, when people are trying to measure the outcomes of these sort of programmes, it's often in terms of teenage pre- pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, and sort of that's about it. In other words, if someone can get to age 20, without having been pregnant or caught a sexually transmitted disease, then that's a victory. You know, you've obviously done a good job and that they're home and dry. I was there needs to be a, a much longer term view because people's there's the emotional relational effect of, of early promiscuous sex and the emotional effect of abortions or whatever. And these have an effect on people throughout their lives. So even if these short term targets have been met, it still might have led someone down a road that ultimately is going to be very harmful to them through the rest of their life. But I, I would assume those sort of long-term consequences over decades are pretty inaccessible to any sort of quantitative research, are they? No, not particularly. No, there's quite a lot of research looking at the longer-term impacts of early sexual behaviour. Uh-huh. Um, and it's, it's difficult sometimes to, to tease out cause and effect because you know a, a young person may have sex early and, and perhaps they're from a very dysfunctional family and, that, and that's part of the con- reason why they did and of course that will then feed into longer term consequences as well uh-huh. but there's some pretty strong evidence that you know engaging in, in early sexual behavior is associated with strong strong disadvantage throughout life in terms of um, you know educational outcomes uh, yeah. but also uh, economic outcomes and psychological outcomes later on so there's quite a lot of research yeah, um, but, but, but does any of it connect it with sex education though? Because I would say the style of sex education uh, in Scotland sort of corrupts young people and it gives gives them it pervades a set of values that I think are very dangerous to someone's yeah. uh, that, life that path. To if, if you like, that would be quite yeah. quite difficult to uh, to get to. Now, I think what, what you're saying about the the evidence about the effect of early promiscuous sex or whatever, and uh, like you say, there is an absolute mountain of it. I just think if you're taking the so-called harm reduction approach to sex education, this should be exactly the information that you're you're sharing with young people. We're always hearing, you know, we need to provide the young people with the information, then they can make their own decisions. But I just think, but they don't provide them with, with the information. This this is really crucial information, but it doesn't get a look in yeah, at I, all. No, I, I completely agree. And and uh, but by the way, you know, I'm not necessarily opposed to, to sex education in schools um, mm-hmm. you know, I think it covers a whole range of different different things and, and clearly there's some information which you know young people need, need to have and schools can might well be helpful in that and especially if they're working with parents to to deliver mm-hmm. that and really the issue should be more about the type of information the age it's given at and how it is pro, you know pro, pro, how yeah. it's provided and they're the things we yeah. you know people might might disagree on but absolutely Know, practical information and, and that's yes on the consequences of particular types of behavior also very simple things you know lots of talk about p- providing uh, contraception and birth control for young people but providing actual realistic information on uh, how many young people when they use birth control how many of them end up getting pregnant not not mm-hmm. to scare people but just to be be practical that because the, the impression can sometimes be well you know if you have having sex as long as it's consensual and you're using a condom or what have you everything's okay but actually young people knowing that probably the majority of abortions that take place in, in this country are the result or, or happen after people were using some form of contraception you know so there are and particularly when you're younger there can be very high mm-hmm. failure rates um, again, not to not talk about scaring people, just giving practical information that you know this is something which yep. will not 
um, you know, necessarily eliminate uh, the, the risks. And I think people are sometimes worried about that, giving that sort of information because they think, oh, it'll stop young people accessing the services or using uh, these mm -hmm. things. Well, actually, once you go down that line of sort of trying to sort of hold that information back from young people at, at, at an appropriate age, um, you know, it's probably not a good good line to go down. No. I find sometimes I've uh, put forward the, the sort of evidence that we were just talking about ago, to write a minute ago about the effects of early promiscuous sex or whatever, uh, and the fact that basically couples who marry, neither of them having had sex before, tend to be the most stable marriages, etc. all that sort of thing. And quite often it's just met with derision. People just, it's so alien to people, have never heard anything like it. People just assume it must be completely off the wall, completely incredible uh, data. And yet there's, there's a mountain of evidence towards it. I mean, one of our policies is that, that this sort of factual content needs to be in sex education. If, if you've seen young people have got to make their own decisions, then you've got to provide them with the, the information. Because in terms of someone's life story, I mean, this is going to be one of the most crucial aspects of it, isn't it? So the way relationships, sexual relationships work out over someone's lifetime, how their family works out as well. That's one of the most important aspects of life. And yet the, all this evidence is left out. So, but when it comes to smoking, for example, I mean, they're really hot on the evidence. They'll tell you the percentage of people who, who get all sorts of things at all sorts of levels, with all sorts of amounts of smoking and what age you start and stop and whatever. It's, it's all there. Um, but then when it comes to sex and relationships, that's just completely missing. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, there's, there, you're right, there is a huge amount of evidence out there. Sometimes it is hard to, um, it's very hard type of research to do, I think, sometimes mm -hmm. on the relationships to, to identify really what, what is causing what. Um, uh -huh. and, uh, so I've got some sympathy, you know, disentangling, um, you know, causal effects of, for example, you know, couples get, getting married because they may be a different type of couple who are likely to have better outcomes anyway uh -huh. and, there's, and there's not easy way around, around that sort of thing but um but you're right you know in terms of the sort of correlation and the, the data is quite overwhelming in terms of the outcomes and yeah children should know about that yeah i was talking to someone once who taught uh, personal social health education and they were talking in a, in a personal capacity and they said I, I just can't see the point of marriage I thought, well, to me, that, that's like a maths teacher saying they you know, they don't really get division. They, they can't really understand how that works. Because to my yeah, mind, I mean, how can you possibly teach about that area if, you, if you're admitting that you don't understand the most fundamental concepts or social institution that's been at the heart of it sort of, sort of throughout human history? That's quite a big confession to make. And yet... Yeah. It's, it's not on the syllabus. It's, it's not covered. Okay. You, th you think the answer to that would be well? If I don't understand it, and as you say, it's so prevalent throughout history, you know, uh -huh. for, for, for good or ill, is that I'll go and do a bit of research and make sure I understand the basis for it. Even if you know you, you yeah. still end up not thinking it's a very strong basis, you should know what it is first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's just, it's like I was saying earlier. Basically, it reflects the, the personal opinions of the people who are involved in creating the materials and pushing that approach, uh, really clearly. Uh, it's it's quite hard to i mean have you ever come across anyone that, that you think their personal views uh, are completely distinct or, or distant from their views on what the policy should be in these areas do such people exist pro pro probably not and, I, and i'm not sure that's necessarily a bad thing we've all got our, uh -huh. our values and, and it's right that we, they, they dare and inform what policy uh -huh. should be but i think what i, I get upset about is when it's sort of hidden behind a veneer of, of evidence. And so people have a particular outcome um, and they, you know, they're determined to, to achieve that. So let, you know, as I said earlier, I think let's be, be honest and frank about what values we have. I think you can, to some extent, separate out. You can look at the evidence objectively and hopefully, um, you know, something certainly economists are, are, are trained to do to separate out what we call the positive and the normative, the positive, the things that will happen if you do this or may happen and looking at the evidence. And then the normative, what you think should happen and mm -hmm. with, with humans and human nature it means you've got to work quite hard to to you know not only pick out the evidence that fits your your worldview but i think it is yeah. possible to do mm -hmm. that you know that's where peer review comes in and people being critical of what what you do and working with other people and discussing things you know uh, to a greater or lesser extent i think it is possible to separate those things out and um 
you know, at least be honest. And, and uh, there's nothing wrong even with saying, well, actually, even though the sort of sociological evidence may say this despite that, I think it's wrong in itself. And so I don't think we should yeah. do that policy. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that that sort of approach, no. um, even if, you know, on, on, on either side. But just be honest about what your, yeah. your values are. Yeah, I think our policy is to try and steer a middle line with this. So, for example, I mean, being pro-marriage is one of our party's fundamental principles. Promote marriage in society because that, that helps to, to solve all sorts of social problems. So in terms of education, we don't want lessons where the teacher is saying, you know, you all ought to get married because that's what you're supposed to do. But I think having a lesson where you say, right, these are the statistics. This is the evidence. This is these are the arguments in favor of marriage. This is this is why some people think it works. And say so most importantly, these are the statistics. I think educationally, that's perfectly valid. I think there can be no justification for saying, no, we don't want that. We don't want them learning about that. But on the other hand, when it comes to pornography, I, when I was teaching, I've taught lessons about pornography. But the, uh, the lessons from the Scottish government, you know, say, have fun with porn. This is perfectly normal and natural. And that's a quotation from one of their videos. Really? Ha have fun with porn. Yeah. And it recommends different genres of pornography you might like to exp uh, explore if you're not happy with uh, you know the sort of standard type. So, so that's the, um, the sort of line they take. So I would say you know, teach about pornography as well. Teach about the dangers of it. Teach about all facets of it. But don't actually give the message of, of saying to them, you know, that this is a good thing. Why don't you go ahead and, and try it? When you read the, there's an agency that produced the sex education materials for the government. If you look at their explanation of them, the explanation is, is what we would agree with. You know, young people need to understand about this and they need information so they can, they can understand uh, various issues related to it. But they don't convey what the message actually is that they're delivering, which, which is go ahead, it's fine, have fun, it's perfectly normal and natural. Don't, and, you know, don't let anyone tell you otherwise and don't you feel guilty. It's nothing to be ashamed of using pornography. That's the message they give. So it's very definitely a, a moral message or an anti-moral message. And are, are parents happy with that message being given? Do they know that that's what's going on? Uh, the majority don't know. We actually commissioned an opinion poll in the summer, a professional opinion poll. And for the, we asked about the statement, you know, ha have fun with pornography. I can't remember the results off the top of my head. I think it was the balance of opinion was definitely against that. Most adults were against it. Generally, the, the younger people were, the more likely they were to think, yep, that's fine. Um, uh, people over 55 would be most strongly against it. Sorry? But they, they were fine with it as a message to give children in schools or just as a general uh, message for people? Uh, within a school. That, that's to 50, 15 to 17-year-olds that video is for. So the, the balance in the population, there were more people saying, no, that's not right, than were saying it is right. By a substantial margin. I, I can't remember exactly, but it was uh, you know, the balance was definitely on the side of they don't like it. So, so we wrote to the education secretary and said, look, this is public opinion in Scotland. This is, you know, proper opinion poll. People in general in Scotland are against this message. What have we got to say about it? Uh, well, the, the, it was out of con the question was out of context. The question wasn't out of context. The question was in a video about pornography for 15 to 17 year olds. The, the line is that then it gives it doesn't just like quote the two words. It gives, it gives a big sentence about it, and they, they just say, "Yeah, but it's out of context. The, the question's not balanced or, or whatever." Just one way or another, they they ignore it. And the other frustration with that is we had this opinion poll done. Uh, we asked about all sorts of other aspects of the sex education materials as well. And, and generally, the, the balance of opinion was the, the materials were like completely out of order and people thought they were you know, inappropriate at the very least. And you, know, you send that to a press release to the media in Scotland, which, I mean, that should be a news story, shouldn't it? The public are against the sex education resources yeah. of the government. Nothing. Nothing. Not a glimmer of interest from any uh, mainstream media source. Um, all the other political parties, I mean, they're aware of, basically we've stirred up controversy about it. There's the Scottish Family Party, and there is quite a bit of momentum, quite a bit of controversy. So a lot of the politicians, they're aware of the strength of feeling, but it's as though even the ones who might actually be a little bit conservative in their views, it's as though they don't actually take a stand against it. That they just want the issue to go away. That they, they don't want to 
to touch it. I don't know if their parties tell them that or if just personally they just think, oh, it's not going to be worth a hassle. I'm just going to keep my head down. Uh, it, it's the same uh, in the Navy pressure from parties, but certainly the tradition in the UK, there, are all, there have been individual MPs, certainly in the, in the UK Parliament, who've been willing to, mm -hmm. you know, from all parties actually, to, to stick their head above the parapet and speak out on some of these issues, even if they're, they're in a minority. So it's a shame if you haven't got uh, many in Scotland um, who, who are willing to do that. Yeah, that, that's one of the differences. In the UK Parliament, um, there are a, a small handful of people who will be a bit more independently minded, but in the Scottish Parliament. It's a reflection it, it, of the society in general, more in, in Scotland. Is, it, or is that a reflection of the way in which candidates are selected and, the, and the, the way that they, you know, what they have to do to get through the party system? Or, or does that just reflect what people think in the, in the electorate? Uh, I think it's a bit of both. I, I think there's huge groupthink in, in, in Scotland. Um, it's not just politicians who are afraid to say what they think. Almost everyone in Scotland has got a reason not to say what they think on controversial subjects. It's either your job or the course you want to apply for next year or it's your partner's job or, or it's it's a, another company you might want to move to or, or it's the charity you volunteer with or, or whatever. There's just some reason where you think it was this really a good idea. This could backfire on me one way or another. So for a huge number of people, they take the choice or oh, just, just keep my head down. And the same applies in the in the parliament i think the the conservative party of the, of the view that you know they want to position themselves sort of just very slightly to the left of the other parties and they don't want right. to get into right. any right. Right. sorry just just to the right of the parties and they don't want to get into any of these controversial areas that might result in them end up you know ending up being called you know victorian or homophobic or illiberal or whatever they just don't want any controversy over these social issues. They don't want to talk about things with numbers in, basically. So they completely keep out of this uh, and it goes on challenge. Well, it's not, it's not a healthy situation, I think, when there's no opposition or people putting a different point different point of view uh -huh. on these, yeah. these issues. Yeah. But you, you would think, it's bizarre with the media, let's say you're the editor of the Scottish Sun. Okay, I don't know if you can imagine that or not. And you've got this opinion poll that's got some of the, and there's some dreadful, images tasteless to say the least images from the sex education resources and we've got opinion poll data about the fact that the public agrees that these are pretty disgusting and they shouldn't be anywhere near a classroom now surely that's a juicy news story isn't it that, that's something that's going to be interesting for people to see to see these pictures and to see what people think but nothing they won't touch it it's like a taboo subject so, so the the general public, I mean, people really do get wound up about this. And there's great strength of feeling. Uh, people will be quite active in opposing it. But actually, within the system, so it's like a, a taboo. People won't touch it. Yeah. In, in, interesting. It sounds uh, you know, not too dissimilar to what's happening in, in England, but perhaps we, we, we have got a few more voices who are willing to, to speak up on some of these issues. Yeah. Just to finish the, for the viewers, we have got a, a plan up our sleeve to bring some of these issues uh, to more people's attention. I won't tell you what it is because it needs to be a, we need the element of surprise to do it. But watch this space. We've got something up our sleeve in the next couple of weeks on that front. Well, time has flown by. That was really interesting. David, really appreciate bringing your expertise and knowledge to us. So lots of uh, lots of new thoughts there. And lots of encouragement as well. So that was uh, that was really great. So Good, thanks for taking the time to be with us. Maybe in a I don't know in a couple of years' time, you've got a new batch of research for us. We can maybe speak to you again. That'd be, uh, that'd be great. Okay. Right. Thanks very much. Right. Good okay. night, everyone. Good thanks night. Bye.